Oh, I'm delighted to be joined by the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson from a country pile that we as taxpayers uh, own. Uh, I'm sure it's an appreciating asset for all of us, Boris. I hope you're enjoying yourself down in Chevening. Um, Foreign Secretary, if I could just start by... Hi there. Morning. Morning to you. You can hear me all right. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, I, you've just, I, I've just uh, caught you. How are you, Robert? Morning. Uh, couldn't be better, and it's a all, all, great pleasure to see you now. If I could just start with this national insurance rise. Was there a discussion among senior ministers like yourself before it was announced that this would be breaching the manifesto? Well, uh, we don't go into conversations that we have in Cabinet, clearly, and certainly not uh, conversations before a budget. But uh, let's be in no doubt that, as I think uh, Theresa Villas has just said, and, and indeed Hilary Benn, you have to address the disparity in the treatment between uh, the self-employed and the employed. And it was made very clear at the time when the, uh, the bill to enact the lock on uh, the NIC was put through the House of Commons, uh, that this applied to uh, people in employment, this applied to people in employment, and, uh, you know, you've got, to, you've, got to sort, you've got to address that. And I think it's uh, very, very clear that this budget has got a lot of good stuff in it, uh, particularly for uh, those on low pay. Uh, it's raising thresholds, it's uh, lifting the tax thresholds, and uh, as uh, Theresa Villas has just said, when it comes to the actual issue of uh, of national insurance contributions, you've got to sort out the disparity, but you've also got to look at the, the overall context in which you're doing this. You've got to look at the, uh, the full package that self-employed people are getting. And but, but, uh, but, 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 as but the Prime Minister has said, we're going to come back to that later in the year. That's all very well, but then surely it was a mistake by the Chancellor to announce this before actually putting in place this package of help for the self-employed. That was a schoolboy error, wasn't it? No, I, no. no. No, uh, on the contrary, I think uh, what Philip Hammond did was completely right. He's got uh, some great things in this budget for people on low incomes. He's cutting taxes. Uh, you've got an economy that's growing strongly. And he's trying simultaneously to address a chronic problem that's identified by all uh, serious commentators on the matter, which is the disparity in the, the tax payments made by those who are self-employed and those who are made by uh, those in employment. What is going to happen now is that we're going to uh, look at the, the context in which uh, the self-employed are paying taxes and the benefits that they receive. And uh, there'll be more work done on that before this, the, the bill to enact the provisions on NIC uh, comes forward later this year. And I think that's, that is a very, very sensible way to do it. And when most people look at this budget... Go on. Well, just very briefly before we move on, yeah, this sorry, on. NI rise is definitely going to happen, is it? The, the, the Chancellor has made it very clear that you've got to deal with, and the Prime Minister has uh, also made it clear, you've got to deal with an unfairness in the system. Uh, I'm, you, not you've sure, also I'm not got sure to you're saying it is going to definitely happen. For sustainable, for, sustainable, for sustainable growth. We will come forward later in uh, the year with the provisions to enact what the Chancellor has set out in the budget. And as I say, I think most people looking at it, looking at the strong growth in the UK economy, looking at the way that uh, uh, we're able to cut taxes now for the low paid, that this is an excellent budget that is going to uh, create a platform, a strong, robust platform, on which we can go forward over the next few years. I, I think anyone uh, listening to it, but we'll I, move I, on, I is not, is not persuaded story. that this national Go insurance on. rise is actually going to happen. But I, but I want to move on to what the Foreign Affairs Select Committee well, said today. Yeah, um, you know, chaired by an influential Tory, Crispin Blunt, they say there is a very real possibility of there being no Brexit deal at the end of the two years of negotiations, that therefore we will tumble out and be subject to World Trade Organization rules on tariffs. Is that going to happen? Are we going well, to emerge think, from these negotiations I, with no deal? I think that's excessively pessimistic of that otherwise distinguished committee. I think uh, we've got every prospect of doing a very good deal between now and uh, the end of the negotiating period in 20. Is that the most likely outcome? Is and, a deal the most uh, likely outcome? I, I do. I do. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you three reasons why I think it's, uh, it's, it's very likely. First of all, as I was saying just now, uh, thanks to the work of the Conservative-led government over the last uh, few years, you have very strong, robust 
fundamentals for the UK economy. We're in a great position. We're about the fastest growing economy in Europe, uh, one of the fastest growing uh, rich economies in the world. Uh, and, and okay, number, number one, two, we've got number one. We have a very strong and confident, confident number two, got a strong, confident negotiating team. Uh, being led by David Davis, and uh, the, the people uh, who are running this operation are absolutely first class. But the third thing, which I don't think people recognise, is that our partners and friends around the EU desperately want this thing to work. They don't want more misery. Uh, they don't want to fall out with the UK. What they want is, I think, what we want, and what most sensible people in this country want, which is a strong EU uh, connected in a new relationship of friendship and partnership with a strong okay, but can, UK. But can, but can and I, that is what we can do okay. with uh, a great new free okay, trade I get, I get, I get that you're optimistic. I get that you're, opti I get that you're optimistic. All the areas that matter. I get that you're optimistic, but the select committee, which you must agree with, says that there is a meaningful risk of there being no, no deal. And, I'm, and a politician I imagine you respect, Lord Lawson, said only last week he thinks there will not be a deal. The, the Select Committee says you have well, to do serious very... work preparing for the possibility of no deal. Is government doing that serious work, preparing Britain for the prospect that in two years there's no deal? Well, I think that uh, actually as it happens, uh, we would be perfectly OK if we weren't able to get an agreement, but I'm sure that we will, for the reasons that I gave. Don't forget, Robert, that we already have a situation in which our, uh, our regulation, our regulatory framework, our system of tariffs, everything is flush with the EU at the moment. Sure. There is no but, 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 reason but, 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 are you, that should but, but, are not you, be are you putting in place the, Are you putting in place, are you contingency planning for no deal? Uh, as I've said to you, I don't think that the consequences of no deal are by any no, means No, they're fine, but, they made up, but you've still got to prepare for it. Some people like to pretend. But you've still and, got to prepare actually, for it, surely. Actually, I think what you've seen in the budget from Philip Hammond uh, this week, uh, uh, last week, the uh, uh, preparations for Britain over the next few years. We have a very strong, very robust economy, and we have the chance now to do free trade deals. We will have the chance to do free trade deals uh, with countries that we have not been able to engage with properly for 44 years. You may not know this, uh, Robert, but tomorrow yeah. is Commonwealth Day. Yeah. And it is a, a stunning fact. Let me give you one stunning fact for all our viewers, uh, uh, both our viewers. Uh, it, is a, it is a stunning fact that uh, when the Stun UK us. joined the, the common market, the common market, the EU, in uh, the common market back in 1973, it then had, uh, the 28 countries then had about 38% of, of global uh, GDP. The Commonwealth then was about a quarter Come of on, that, speed up. Uh, amount. The EU and the Commonwealth in, in GDP in output terms are now roughly at level pegging, and the Commonwealth is growing far faster. Now, of course the EU is massively important for us and will continue to be just to be absolutely clear your your erstwhile colleague your but we have your the opportunity colleague, we have the opportunity yep, sure. now to do new deals with them absolutely right but your erstwhile colleague jim well. o'neill who is something of an expert on this says there is no possibility of trade deals with the commonwealth compensating for the trade loss uh, with the eu and he used to work with you boris and i assume yes, you think that what he says Robert, i know him well he's a I know him well and I admire him greatly, but uh, as we say in Brussels, as l'un non pêche par l'autre, mon vieux. There is no reason on earth. Right, let's press on. There is no reason on earth. There is no reason on earth why you shouldn't do both. Of, you can do both. No, no, I'm and, not disagreeing. Uh, okay. no, We've got to move on. We've got to move on. We've got to move on. You're going to Russia quite soon yeah. uh, to see your opposite number there. The Sunday Times this morning has a warning, basically a government warning, saying Russia is out to subvert our democratic processes by hacking the computer systems of uh, our political parties. How, how serious a threat is that? Well, I, I think a couple of things. First of all, uh, we have no evidence that the Russians are actually involved in trying to undermine our democratic processes at the moment. We haven't, so, so why uh, are the security you know, services uh, making right, that you know, precise it, it, we don't warning? We actually have that, that evidence. But what we do have is plenty of evidence that the Russians are capable of doing that. And there is no doubt that they've been all up to all sorts of dirty tricks 
uh, bringing down French TV stations, uh, undermining. You've seen what that happened in the United States, where there's no question at all that they were involved in the hacking of the, of the Democratic National Convention. Uh, you've seen uh, what happened in Montenegro, where there was an attempted coup in a, a European state and, and possibly even an attempted assassination of the leader of that state. Now, there is very little doubt that the Russians are behind these things, to say nothing of what they have done uh, in Ukraine. So what will you say to Minister Lavrov uh, about uh, this when you see him? So what will you say to Minister so, Lavrov so when you see him? Our, our message is, is our mess I might present my personal feeling is one of deep, deep sadness, Robert, because if you think back to 10 years or so ago, uh, the time when I was becoming mayor of London, yeah. you know, it, we were going through quite a good phase in our relations with, with Russia. We had huge investment coming in. We used to have Russian festivals in, in Trafalgar Square. We celebrated the friendship and, and partnership between the UK and Russia, and great Russian exhibitions and would come to London. Second, I've just got uh, and, and one it seems more, very I've, sad just, to just me. Got, it's, got, sad. it's sad that that friendship sure. uh, could, cannot continue. So right. we, what we need to have is a, uh, a, a twin-track approach. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, we've got to engage, but we have to beware. And what can we I, want can to I see very briefly ask you one final question? We, we are almost out of time. If I could just ask on. you one final question, which Sorry. is we've got this extraordinary standoff yes. at the moment between the Netherlands and Turkey. What on earth is that yes. all about? And is there anything we should be doing here? Well, this is, I think, very regrettable because they're two NATO countries and uh, they're both uh, great friends of ours. And uh, actually, my, my Turkish friend uh, counterpart, uh, Mevlut Shabasoli, just rang me just now and, you know, I made it perfectly clear to him he wanted to come and have lunch with me. There was, no, there was nothing to, to, to stop him. But uh, obviously, this is something that we hope can be sorted out uh, between those two countries as, as fast as possible. Foreign Secretary, lovely to talk to you.